sponsored by Epic Basing. Link in the description. I was not on the hobby in the 80s or 90s, so the closest thing to Warhammer nostalgia for me is Tau. Everyone that is new to the channel knows that I like Space Marines and Necrons. Tau were my absolute 40k favorites in the early and mid 2000s. Uh, no, no, not because of the space communism thing, but I just love the concept of Japanese themed battlesuits in space and the creative opportunities their aesthetics and geometry offer. If I were to paint an army, these angled armor plates and lots of straight lines would be perfect for quick approaches and would stand out on the table, like directional light through the airbrush or contrasting edge highlights. And when the new codex came out, which Games Workshop kindly sent me a review copy of, I was flipping through its pages, contemplating what scheme I could go for. Ultimately, I painted three XV25 stealth suits as a prototype for the three Tau Sept schemes that I like the most. So not only is this video about me finding a color scheme I'd enjoy painting, but also a tutorial for how to paint these three popular septs. And ideally, you'll also get a few ideas for your own color schemes. One thing that my nostalgia came with, and I want to say that nostalgia in the miniature hobby always comes with, is that the technology of creating figures advanced so much in the last decades. Because of the age of these 20 year old models, they have these massive filled undercuts, which are a necessity for creating two part steel molds that will release the cast without getting stuck. Nowadays, the sprues can be optimized for this process on a computer, but these models are still hand sculpted and sprue arrangement back then was limited. I'm compulsive when it comes to these undercuts and I put in a bit of extra time to get rid of them. I'm starting with the full asset that gradually has become the go-to scheme for Games Workshop's box arts over the years. A spot they have taken from the classic scheme that is nowadays known as the Tau Sept. But let's get started with the painting. Since I wanted to learn as much as possible about how fast I could do these models, I was using the airbrush for the initial steps. I applied a coat of stone gray through the airbrush to build my base. But this didn't quite feel right because my goal was to make the suit look more like the artwork on the codex, which has shades of blue and purple gray in the shadows and a very warm yellow beige tone as highlights. So I took a different approach, starting from a dark tone instead this time. My base tone ended up being a 50-50 mix of Dark Reaper and Nurgling Green, and over this I sprayed a Cenital highlight by adding Pale Sand until the mix was relatively bright. But again, this did not quite give me the yellow luminosity I was aiming for. So I went over this with pure Screaming Skull. And you can see that this was more what I expected, turning the highlights significantly warmer. I also tried to place a few gradients on some elements, like the shoulder guard here, that I could later refine with the brush. Since I lost the intensity of the shadows a bit, I mixed Dark Reaper, which I had on the base color, and added Terradon Turquoise for that extra cool blue hue in the shadows. If you think about it, this is basically the exact opposite of a Cenital highlight. After I was done with airbrushing in the initial lights and shadows, I took the brush and started fleshing out the highlights on the individual panels. I went a step brighter in color, and using pigment pushing and edge highlights, I created some contrast. These minis are made of a lot of panels and angles, which makes them relatively easy to define. You could probably just get away with edge highlights here and make an impression. Personally though, because I couldn't paint a straight line on the first try if my life depended on it, this was a rather traumatic experience. Because so many edge highlights. Anyway, I can't show you all of the process because ain't nobody get time for an hour long video. That said though, I will upload a longer version to the Patreon this month. Here you can see the next step after I defined everything with my first highlight mix, which is increasing the contrast on edges and panels with pure white. A good way to highlight these geometric panels is to pick one edge on a panel and place the brightest highlight there. Then create a gradient within that panel. Here I picked out the left shoulder as the brightest area. Then on all adjacent panels, place the darker part of the gradient on that panel next to the brightest area on the other panel, and vice versa on the panel on the other side. Kind of like non-metallic metal, but not with the extreme contrast difference we use there. After I pushed all the highlights to pure white, it was time to create more diversity in the scheme and to add different color panels. I knew I wanted some darker panels to contrast against the bright ones, so I mixed an off black, you could say, from ashen gray and black to highlight these I mixed in more and more wolf grey and eventually placed last highlights with pure white. Contrast maxed, check. The voila scheme demands a bright intense red for the other panels and markings. 
Contrast paints have these intense, saturated pigments, so I mixed Dark Angels Red and Mephiston Red, and I think this works so well because I had a bright base color that helped the red to pop, while still having a rich dark blood red as a base. Another thing I wanted to add if I ever did an army are these custom marking designs to personalize my gang even more and to be able to add variety to the individual figures as well. And this was a great opportunity to try these different patterns. For any schemes that use red markings, the new Combat Patrol box comes with these pre-made decals that I always like to incorporate, especially since it saves you so much freehanding time. I was using Microsoft and Microset, like usual, to get them in place and to get them flat and borderless. You can find a couple of videos where I show this process more detailed on my channel. I finished out the freehand part of my patterns and then added highlights by adding orange to my base mix. Notice how I'm doing the same panel definition I explained earlier, putting bright parts of a panel next to dark parts of the adjacent panel and so on. For the last highlights, I'm adding some tall light ochre. Wait a second, where's the apostrophe in Tau? The goddamn red conning. I finished out all the panels I wanted in a different color. And then covered the last area that was left to do. The, basically the underpants with two diluted layers of gore around the fur contrast because I didn't really want to invest more time at this point. Now we're diving into weathering and wear and tear. As always, you can invest as much or as little time into this as you want. Remember that you can do all of this with sponge chipping to speed things up if you want to. Your world, your rules. I went for a more detailed scratch pattern because I wanted to treat these as prototypes for an army scheme, like I said, and I wanted to get a feeling for how much time all of these steps would take and where I could speed things up if necessary. What I'm always doing when it comes to creating these scratched paint patterns is to roughly match the color below the red paint or with a paint layer on top. Again, going back to the cover art of the codex, I wanted a tiny bit more color variation. So I added these controlled washes of snakebite leather. Whenever I use contrast paints as washes, I thin them down with contrast medium and break the surface tension a bit with dish soap. I also experimented with how inner glow would work with these schemes. So using fluorescent paint, I went for a blue weapon glow here. Because it's transparent, you can gradually build the foundation of this light with pure fluorescent paint, covering more area and then gradually covering less and less area with brighter mixes. In the box arts, Games Workshop uses these dark chipped edges as a means to increase readability on their paint jobs. Because the base color is so bright, almost white, contrast can only be built with darker colors. So in a way, it's a reverse edge highlight. I wanted to also do this on the more monotonous bright areas on my versions, because again, I want to show you as many things as possible. And it's up to you to leave them out if you want to. I'm basically running my brush or the side of the brush across the edge. Slightly dried in paint works best for this, by the way. There's just something about how fresh paint wants to pull in a way that leaves less opaque spots and we want this paint to cover on the first pass. With the first version done, let's talk about bases. I wanted a relatively simple base, like a dry wasteland that doesn't even support vegetation and probably never did. So using my Elegoo Mars 3 printer, which they sent to me ages ago and finally I had the courage to try. And I printed out some crystal patterns by Epic Basing. I was a bit hesitant to pick up 3D printing, because let's face it, it's a whole other hobby in itself and I didn't want to have to experiment for days to get settings that would work. But it turns out that this fear was completely unfounded. The Mars 3 is as plug and play as it gets. This is the first time I ever printed something and I got really good results right away. The washing and cleaning station makes the whole process even more convenient and easy to pick up. And I could use all of these bits in my project. At this point, let me just quickly say thanks to this video's sponsor, Epic Basing. You know that I only take on sponsors whose products I'm using or would be using myself. And the basic material that Epic Basing produces is no different. No matter your skill level and whatever level of detail you're aiming for, Epic Basing bits will level up your basing with ease. The huge variety of designs they have available allows you to adapt any base to the size, pose or orientation of your miniature. Bases are so important when trying to add additional storytelling and world building to your display minis and armies alike and Epic Basing is here to unlock these stories and to help you craft the worlds your characters live and die on. Their collection ranges from organic designs like trees, 
and other vegetation over a huge variety of rocks and crystals to urban designs and man-made objects joining the range theater this year. They have a unique design philosophy with each of these designs coming in larger features and fitting covers as well as tuners which are singles of that same element to blend together the other parts any way you want. This provides a maximum of customization and all features, covers and fillers are interchangeable retaining the functions within the system. So no matter if you're aiming for a simple base design like I did, or if you want to use the complete system for that unique or inspiring display base, whether you're building armies, dioramas or terrain, Epic Basing can scale to your needs. And if you don't have a 3D printer, Epic Basing has pre-printed designs available to order directly for most wargaming miniature sizes. So if you are interested, follow the link in the description, use the code TREASURETROF10 for a 10% discount on your first order and get creative. Like I said, I wanted a more barren and simple base, so I took the blister copper patterns and used milliput to create uneven ground around them. Once I figured out where I wanted the mini to stand, I pressed it into the fresh milliput to later be able to find the right spot again. I sculpted a few rocks around the resin prints for a more integrated result. I just love to experiment with different textures, so here I tried something new. I took AK's beach sand, which is finely grained texture in a thick medium, and added some more diverse grain size to it, and then spread it out on the basis. After base coating, I went for two coats of English uniform, and then started to define the rocks with a mix of English uniform and tall yellow ochre. The texture turned out exactly the way I wanted to, forming these smaller ripples, which provided the perfect surface to brush on a relatively dry version of my highlight mix. After a final highlight with tall light ochre, I'm washing everything with a mix of burnt umber, English uniform and a matte medium to reduce the inherent shine of inks. For the metal bubbles, I used a mix of dark sea blue and black and gradually highlighted them by adding white. Halfway through, I mixed a bit of red in to get a purple tone of variation with the blue in the base color and then just mixed in more white for the final highlight. As a final touch, I wash the metal areas with orange rust liquid pigments, simply because they are more saturated and intense. Next up, I wanted to find an interesting scheme for the Ta'u Sept. And I see a bit of a pattern here with failed first attempts, because I went for XV88, which I was expecting to be a great base color to shade and highlight. But something just went wrong and I got a really weird, dull and uninteresting finish. I decided to counter that by adding a bit of snake bite later, and then started my senatal highlights by adding scruffulous brown. Again, I wanted a really intense, luminous mid-tone and highlight color, and scruffulous brown is a super chromatic yellow-brown that is one of my favorite colors for a lot of things, like intense yellows and non-metallic metal gold. For shadows, I didn't pick a cool color this time, but I applied Gore Grunt of Fur from below through the airbrush. Since I already went all the way up to Scruffulous Brown for the zenithal airbrushing, I had to go brighter for the initial highlights by brush. So I added some tall light ochre. I already went over my process how to work with these panels, so here's a montage with some dope music instead. If you're not confident in your highlight abilities yet, if you feel like you can't push these pigments just right yet to create gradients, embrace texture instead. See how I'm using brush strokes in a crisscross pattern and how these patterns fade out towards areas I want darker. This is a valid strategy to create gradients and transitions. Remember, there isn't just one way to paint, find out what you're comfortable with and what suits your style. My last highlights go on with almost pure ice yellow. For these last reflections, I'm using pure ice yellow selectively. Looking at my panels, the highlights were fine, but the lines between the panels were too bright and uneven. So taking my shade color, Gork around the fur, and breaking the surface tension with a bit of dish soap, I let this mix run into the recesses undiluted, and that was enough to cover the area properly. Alright, time to create variation in the scheme. I did this by covering some panels and by adding freehands again. One of my go-to colors for white is stone gray, and I picked out a couple of panels and elements with it. 
to keep the luminosity in the highlights I was adding ice yellow again and defined by panels. Sometimes I felt like my base color for the white was too bright, so I added a shade color from stone gray and ashen gray. The good thing is you can just add more or less ashen gray depending on where on the mini the shades are supposed to be and how dark you want them to be. To max out the contrast, I picked out the edges with white again. The only thing left to paint was again the underpants and I didn't want to add any additional color so I went for a black in the form of my proven ashen grey and black mix. We already went through how I highlighted these so here's just a few clips. I wanted one scheme that didn't have the inner weapon glow but I still needed to define the lenses on the helmet which I did by adding more and more fluorescent orange to the red color mix I used in the first color scheme. Unfortunately, there's no decals for schemes that use white markings, so I had to freehand those. Then I applied a similar markings pattern. I had to build some shadows on the lower part of that pattern, so on goes an opaque layer of my proven ashen grey and stone grey mix. And on the transitional area, I can just glaze over a few layers of pure stone grey to smooth out the gradient. For the scratches I applied, I made sure to add a bright line below every dent. While we could get away without these on the red, I feel like on the white, which is brighter as a whole, the extra contrast makes it more interesting. Optionally, we can go for these dark chips on the edges of the white again. And I'll even extend this to the ochre parts this time. It just makes a bit more sense that if one area gets banged up, so would the adjacent ones. For the third scheme, I wanted a cooler color, contrasting with some bright orange, so the Sasea set was the optimal choice. Everyone loves the good orange and teal. I went straight for Dark Reaper as a base color, knowing that I started a bit too bright for the last two schemes. I then transitioned into highlights by adding Rust Gray, and eventually a coat of pure Rust Gray and a final highlight with Wolf Gray. And the pattern continues. My shadows just got too bright. So I brought them back with Dark Reaper and Pterodon Turquoise. I didn't go all the way to Wolf Grey with the Senator highlights, so I still had pure Wolf Grey to define my panels. Starting with edge highlights wherever I needed them, and then defining the shapes with a mix of all the techniques we went over in the earlier two iterations. Crisscross patterns, pigment pushing, and bright panels next to darker panels. And I still can't draw straight lines. Motherfucker. As a last highlight, I added white. It just felt like otherwise there wouldn't be enough contrast. I don't like to go for white highlights on everything, but I think it's important to keep an open mind while painting, stopping and analyzing whether or not all boxes are ticked, and compensating whenever it's needed. So here white to increase the contrast felt like the way to go. Further down on the mini, I don't go as bright as on these top parts, but I still define all of the panels the same way. Remember, brighter areas next to dark ones. Like I said, I wanted the other panel color to contrast against the cool blue-gray, but I still wanted to start from a hue that was similar in a way. That means I add a dark sea blue to Scruffler's brown, which shifts the warm color a bit more to the cooler side, which also means the pure yellow highlights would stand out even more. Then I started putting in the highlights, defining the shapes again. Finally, I know what this pop means that the kids like to say today. You can see that the orange contrasts nicely versus the almost green looking base color and stands out a lot.
After the initial layer was done, I added tall light ochre again and focused on edges mostly. And what? How can I not paint straight lines after 20 years of doing this? On the bright side, you can still win golden demons, even if you are coordinatively challenged. Then I put in more weathering again, blending together the orange and the blue parts of the armor as much as possible. As a last element, I went for the dark chips on the bright edges again. This time using a mix of ashen grey and black, thinking brown would probably not fit all that well here. Remember, especially on the edges, this works extremely well if the paint isn't fresh from the palette, but a little dried in. For the weapon glow, I chose magenta this time. I was using Chimera Colors version. You can just use any magenta, even an ink. The truth is, I simply don't own any other magenta that is from the more mainstream brands. Again, I'm establishing the darker tone in all of the recesses. Then I gradually added fluorescent magenta for that extra vaporwave effect. And I'm covering less and less area. And then stipple on white in a very confined area to represent the brightest and hottest spot. Thanks for watching. If you want more general painting tips, check out this video. And remember that I have tons of videos on how to paint other factions like this one. Keep pushing that pigment and I'll see you in the next one.